And we are live. Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good something to wherever people are finding us right now. Um, welcome to the Craft Week's second Makers Meetup of the week. Um, my name is Scott Pollock. I'm the Senior Director of Public Engagement and Programs. I'm super excited to have everybody join us for, again, the second installation of our Maker Meetup series, um, part of the Bay Area Craft Week. Um, we are joined with us today. We have a couple, of, at least the next 60 minutes. Um, uh, we're joined by two incredible colleagues from the Balvani, um, Naomi and Neil, who we'll give a longer introduction to in just a minute. And of course, my colleague here, Lindsay Noble, um, who's our engagement manager. It's lovely to see all the great faces joining in this room and jumping into this conversation and perhaps maybe more of this experience, which we'll chat about in just a bit. Um, really, again, happy for um, and glad everybody's joined us uh, for this conversation. We are, um, you know, partway through the week, uh, our, our San Francisco Bay Area Craft Week, um, just to report and give everybody an update. We are, um, this is a project that continues through Sunday. We are, you know, overreached and exceeded our 50,000 artist sale mark, which we're really excited about to see all this interaction with incredible artists from all across the country who are joining us for the Marketplace Project. Um, I think there's 130 different artists um, who are part of that program. Um, we've had a number of different projects and programs happening throughout the day, including these maker meetups, but also we've been releasing daily features from the Bay Area called Street Scenes. And of course, um, we set together some artist playlists and we've been posting those as we go. Um, so just a quick reminder is um, I'm not the main show today. I really want to turn this over um, to our, our two hosts from the Belveni here. Um, but we're really excited to have everybody join us. A quick reminder that as you're as you're navigating this website and we're we're staying connected by way of Zoom here, um, that we have everybody on mute. It looks like, um, and if you do have a question as we're going along with this this in the next hour, just go ahead and um, um, raise your hand. I think there's a raise hand function in the Zoom session as well as you could also just post a, a question um, in the chat room. There's a chat function if you scroll your your mouse across the screen here, you'll see this little widget pop up that says chat. So feel free to add comments, welcome everybody, introduce yourself, but mostly ask questions as we go along. And either Lindsay or I will pick those questions up and transfer those over to you, Neil and Naomi, as you're probably gonna be diving in deep into this experience. Um, so go ahead and use those functions as well. And then finally, without further ado, um, I wanna welcome our guests here, um, Naomi and Neil from the Belveni. Super glad to have you. Um, the American Craft Council is super grateful for your sponsorship and ongoing support of, of connecting makers communities across the country. You know, we're a national nonprofit that is dedicated to um, connecting and galvanizing diverse craft communities to advance crafts impact in contemporary American life. And part of this is always trying to find and drawing um, connections between the people who work in kitchens or the people who work in fields and the farming fields, producing the materials that we work with to the makers themselves. So this for us is, is right in our wheelhouse. Belveni has been um, a true supporter that showed up at the American craft shows when we were present in, in cities physically, um, taste, hosting tastings. And I'm sure a number of people have been a part of that. Um, and they've also most recently been a part of a series of bar craft projects and programs, which I'm really excited. Maybe perhaps we'll have some time to talk about that. Both Neil and Naomi have um, worked with blacksmiths and glassmakers, um, leather workers, and really uh, lifting up the craft of um, that we see in, in, in the bar scenes and the restaurant scenes and bringing um, this incredible long-standing tradition of whiskey making and whiskey tasting and, and really socializing um, together through all those different mediums. So really appreciate your work there. So without further ado, um, Neil and Naomi, I'm going to let you take it away and the floor is yours. Um, uh, got got, got our, our, our ingredients in hands and we're really excited to have you here join us today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, honestly, we're so uh, happy to be here. The Our time with the American Craft Council has been such a fascinating part of this job that I didn't expect or, you know, know much of when I first got hired. And I was uh, telling Scott before we got started that it was super funny that a couple months into this role, I suddenly was adding skills to my resume, like, you know, decent knowledge of blacksmithing at this point. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, not something you would expect from a whiskey ambassador role. So it's really been quite a treat. 
Well, I think uh, that's quite funny, Naomi, because although I've done blacksmithing sessions so far, I still don't think I've got much of a knowledge because everything <laughs> I've hit with a hammer really hard has uh, not really looked as beautiful as I imagined it to be at the end, but we'll get there. <laughs> <just blacksmithing. laughs> okay. Um, so let's let's get on to what we do and, and and the people that we represent. So Naomi and myself are uh, ambassadors for a distillery and a, and a distillery in Speyside in Scotland. And many of you might be able to tell by my accent, I have a slight Scottish twang that I have not lost in Los Angeles yet. But the Balvenie itself is a real special place for whiskey lovers um, all over the world to visit because it's one of the only uh, distilleries left in Scotland that makes whiskey in an old fashioned way, in a traditional sense. And we're one of very few distilleries in Scotland that can really make our whiskey grain from glass. Now our, our story starts when the family that still owns us to this day, William Grant and Sons, built Glenfiddich by hand. And about five years after that, the family had the opportunity to buy a mansion next door to uh, Glenfiddich called uh, New Balvenie Castle. And it was a big mansion and it was perfect for malting barley in. And they bought that and built the distillery around that house. Now today, that distillery still sits on the same site, but there's been a few changes. We've increased production size, and that original mansion that we used as the maltings process, uh, uh, process kind of site, we knocked that down in uh, the early 1920s and rebuilt a custom-made floor maltings, which still stands there to this day. And one thing that makes it Balvenie that sits, uh, you know, in the valleys of Speyside, so amazing is the people that Naomi and myself represent. And one of the things that really describes and epitomizes what we do at the Balvenie is we've always used a term, handcrafted. And that term handcrafted came on the first one of the Balvenie single malt bottles ever released to the world. And it was a term handcrafted in Bamshire. And Bamshire is an area of northeast of Scotland that's very close to the River Spey, which many people know as Speyside. And that traditional way of making whiskey and that handcrafted way of whiskey, to describe that, the Balvenie has these five rare crafts, which although not unique to the distillery itself, combined make us the most handcrafted of single malts. And really before we get into those, with any good whiskey presentation, you really need something in your glass, don't you, Naomi? I believe so. And we've, uh, I don't know about you guys, but Neil and I have been on a lot of uh, work calls and all that jazz today. So I think I'm about as ready for a whiskey as any of you. Um, we're actually going to try first, uh, if you've already poured the 12, no worries, but this is our 14 Caribbean cask. We're going to chat about a little bit before uh, before we get going. So this is actually the first Balvenie I ever tried. So it holds a very special place in my heart in that way. Uh, I was still a bartender in Manhattan and I tried this whiskey and I worked at a rum bar and it absolutely blew my mind, mostly because it was bringing together two of my greatest loves, which was scotch and rum. Um, so it really was quite a treat at the time. And I think one of the reasons people love this so much and it's doing so crazy well in the US is because it hits kind of every corner of the whiskey lover market. For people who are a little bit new to whiskey, which maybe some people on this call are, the rum cask finish gives it a little bit of this vanilla sweetness at the end that really helps draw people in. But at the same time for the connoisseurs who are you know very much used to whiskey, and are already fans, this has so much crazy savory complexity that it also appeals to them. So it's really an all around winner. And so essentially what I mean by finishing, and Neil is gonna talk a little bit more about this at the end uh, with the history of finishing because it has to do with our amazing malt master, David Stewart. Uh, but just so you know what the term means is essentially a whiskey spends most of its life in one type of barrel, and then you take it from that barrel and move it into another type. And so that last little bit of time is called finishing. 
So this one gets 14 full years in American oak, which is ex bourbon barrels. And that's gonna give it a lot of that vanilla, caramel, honeyed sweetness that you might associate with a bourbon with a little bit of that single malt heftiness. And then it gets moved into for an extra couple of months, these Caribbean cask rum barrels that used to hold rum. And one thing that's kind of cool especially for people who really appreciate uh, woodworking and the craft that goes into that, is as we all know, every piece of wood is different, right? So this whiskey could be in the exact same barrel type in the exact same space for the exact same amount of time and two barrels next to each other are still going to be a little bit different because wood is natural. And so when people ask how long the finishing is for the extra little time in rum, it actually depends. It's going to be anywhere from a couple of months to closer to a year, depending on the cask and its influence. So our malt master, David Stewart, last time I was in Scotland, uh, we actually were working on the finishes of the Caribbean cask when we were trying a bunch in a row. And it was amazing to see how different natural pieces of wood could influence this whiskey because four months could be pretty different glass to glass. So quite a, you know, a testament to the delicacy and balance of the wood that influences it. Um, but yeah, so I hope you guys enjoy, drink some whiskey and uh, love this little Caribbean cask. So cheers. Neil, you want to chat about, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Scott. Well, I just I just saw a lovely question there from Carol, and it's only appropriate the Scotsman takes yeah. a price point of uh, point. Now, price in uh, single malt has been going up because of demand for a couple of years now, so it's been quite consistent. However, the thing that is sabotaging people in this country is the politics, and the politicians are uh, putting taxes on products to uh, hurt other people's countries, which are going back and forward. So uh, that can all be resolved. Reach out to your uh, local representative. A lot of people in the wine industry and spirits industry are losing their jobs because of these taxes on both sides of the industry. Not only our people in Europe, but like American distillers are getting massively hurt by these economic things. So that's kind of why the price has hopped up as well uh, just recently. So there's the first question answered. Uh, but going back onto the Balvenie, what makes us so special is these Balvenie five rare crafts. And when we talk about the five rare crafts, as I said, they're not individually uh, special to the Balvenie, but combined they make us most handcrafted. And the first one of Balvenie's rare crafts is that we have our own farm where we get a percentage of our grain needs from. Now, single malt whiskey is made of three ingredients, barley, water, and yeast. And, you know, water comes off of the Colvin Hills behind us uh, for our whiskey. Yeast is naturally found in the air, although we cultivate it and we use our own strain. But barley is the kind of main ingredient for taste and flavor. And if anyone's been to Scotland, you see lots and lots of barley fields. I come from a a touch into a farmer's background is one of my best friends is a big farmer. And although you see a great deal of barley fields around Scotland, many of those fields, those the barley planted in them is going to animal feed. And to get distiller grade quality grain is a lot harder. It's a lot harder in Scotland because of basically the erratic weather that we have. And we're looking for a really dry barley when we get it delivered to the uh, distillery. So the Balvenie has its own farm and it surrounds the distillery, about a thousand acres of farmland. And when that farm was taken over by the Wiseman family in 1993, we wrote into the lease that they had to give us each year a percentage of um, their fa uh, farm usage or acreage to give us a percentage of grain. And we were kind, you know, because of the wild conditions in Scotland, where the, when in the middle of summer, you don't know whether it's going to rain, shine or snow. It can be a hard, you know, crop to guarantee large amounts of. But since 1993, we have sourced homegrown malt from our own farm and we continue to do that to this day. And uh, in fact, this year we just released our first bottling that was our first ever grain to glass bottle and quite a cool thing for us to do. But the farm itself, for me, is the, is the first and best way to kind of showcase what we look at as the craftsman's journey. 
And at the Balvenie, we, we look at the craftsman's journey as having three distinct stages. It starts off as the apprentice. A lot of the time in the Scotch whiskey industry, that's local people coming to the distillery as a great job just after school and start learning their craft. And then as they progress and move out of that apprentice journey, they go into the craftsman stage, very capable of doing the job and every day working, learning with their hands. And that's really the middle section. So when we talk about those two sections, we're talking, I think for me, about Mark Wiseman, who's a son of James Wiseman, and he's the apprentice. And then we have James, who's a probably a 50, 60 year old farmer, craftsman, done the years. But the final stage of that craftsman's journey, and when these individuals are in the twilight, essentially, of their career, we like to describe them as master craftsmen. And every single one of our five rare crafts has that. And in fact, in the farm, the grandfather who's, you know, ran the family business all these years, I think now at 86 years old, still goes down to the farm every day to check up on his son and grandson just to make sure they're doing it right. So that's the first one of the five rare crafts. Over to you, Naomi, on the second. So um, our second kind of rare craft that we talk about are our floor maltings. And malting is essentially in the whiskey making process. It's the step where you are trying to get your barley to hit the peak level of sugar because that sugar is eventually going to become alcohol. And so you steep it first in water, almost trick the barley into thinking it's spring. And then you spread it out on this huge floor and you turn it slowly for a span of days, can be anywhere from four to eight, depending on the temperature. And what that does is it's um, making sure that the temperature is evenly distributed amongst the barley as the sugar is cultivating. And these floor maltings though, nowadays there are these huge, huge machines that can do this in crazy bulk um, for these huge whiskey companies. We've both been to quite a few of them on tours and things like that. And it's incredible to see it's huge, massive, insane piece of machinery. Uh, we've decided to keep doing it the old school way, which is quite lovely. And I think a lot of this, you know, the people on this call can appreciate that. Uh, we're always looking for people who understand, like we do, how important the phrase handcrafted is, because I think that's overused and abused in uh, this society now. I actually saw a McDonald's billboard with the, the word handcrafted on it one time. And I was like, wow, that is the epitome of that. But essentially, we've chosen to really stick to this hand-turned malting floor. So essentially, that means this barley is spread out and hand-turned by men. And so it's really incredible to see. And one thing I will say when I took this role, I was extremely in love with the brand of the Balvenie. And that's why I took this role. It was a very brand-driven choice. I was very happy bartending. I was having a great time. But I was so in love with this brand that when I found out when this role was open, I just had to go. But the thing is, um, you know, if anyone, all of you have pursued, you know, pursued your passions, one thing you get nervous about is if you join this company that you really kind of revere, is you get nervous that behind the scenes, things are going to be a little bit disillusioned. You know, you're going to um, find, maybe find out some truths you don't want to know, and you never know what marketing can do and all of these things. And it has been astounding since getting this role, what has held up under the, the handcrafted title. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, when you go to the distillery, this sounds very cliche, but it really is like stepping back in time. And this malting floor is the perfect, perfect example of this hand turned barley. Uh, in fact, last time I was there, one of the, the uh, strapping young malt men in our malt barn came running up to me and he was all excited. Uh, and he was like, Naomi, I have to show you something. We are we're moving up in the world. I'm psyched. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so he took me up to the second floor. I was like, did you get a computer finally? And he brought me over and the big modern innovation that had happened was we upgraded from chalkboard to whiteboard uh, in the office of the malt so it's really beautifully handcrafted and old school and lovely. Uh, in fact, even along those lines is that we actually have a ghost in our malt barn. Um, that is not a joke. In fact, if the malt men bring it up and you laugh, which I made the unfortunate mistake of doing when they said that to me, uh, they are dead serious and not messing around. Her name is the Green Lady. And our malt man, Robbie Gormie, has even written poems about her. I mean, she's like this legend at the Balvenie. She has a little bit, they call her the malt monkey, uh, this little monkey that sits on her on her shoulder. And they appear to malt men when they work the night shift, this overnight shift at the malt barn, because the malt has to be turned continuously, so you can't just leave it. 
And there are poems about her, songs about her, and the legend has it that she is actually the ghost of Margaret Douglas. And as Neil mentioned, Balvenie Castle is the namesake. That's how we got named. Um, I just also like bragging at any possible point I can that we have a castle. Uh, but Balvenie Castle is how we, we have our name. And she was this woman who lived there and she was renowned as the most beautiful woman in Scotland at the time. And she ended up becoming a widower. Her husband passed away who owns the castle. And the king allowed her to stay in the castle for the price of one red rose a year. And she was this beautiful woman, and she now supposedly haunts our, our maltings right by the castle. So a little bit of fun there with, uh, with the maltings. So do we have a couple questions before we go to the next one? Um, we apologize, Naomi. We're having a little fun on here. No, all good. <laughs> I'm trying to taste my whiskey in a ceramic mug and feeling this might be a little sacrilege. So I was curious, is there is there a particular is does glassware play an effect on on the experience um, to any degree? And and what should we be knowing about how we either pour it and and um, and what kind of vessel we might want to drink it in? I think uh, at least to speak to myself. I mean, I'm and I think Neil as well. We're first of all just not very pretentious people. So it is your whiskey. Drink it how it makes you happy. That's my always upfront statement. Um, of course, the shape of the glassware is going to make a little bit of a difference um, depending on, you know, is it closed off at the top and kind of funneling in uh, that ethanol and that alcohol burn or is it open and kind of letting that out? What concentrates flavor? What doesn't? Uh, what do you think, Neil? I'm in. I will. I, I was actually kind of waiting for this question to come up because uh, I was really interested in what you've got in your hand because it looks a lot more fancy than the one I've got in my hand. So traditionally, I when, you know, doing any kind of work related stuff with like official nosings and tastings or being part of a competition, I would prefer to use something like this, which is a sherry snifter, essentially but stemmed is really important as it keeps the liquid a little bit further away from anything that might taint it. But your one looks, it looks fancy there. What's that all about? This is actually, uh, this is gonna sound like a promotion plug. It's not at all. I just love these glasses. I use them all the time. Uh, this is by this company called Meat and it was just a biologist and she um, is this very talented woman. And essentially, for those of you who don't know, so women's olfactory senses are actually seven times more sensitive than men's, which means if we don't get in our own way, we can taste things on a seven times more sensitive level than men can, which is amazing. And we should have more women on judging panels. I'm just going to put that out there for tastings because it's like one in 20 or some depressing statistic. But the thing is, and part of the reason I think that this is a holdup and, you know, sometimes too, you even hear women a lot say that they don't like whiskey or don't think they should or it's a man's drink and all these ridiculous things um but a big part of that is that due to the fact that we have such you know sensitive olfactory senses is that if you are using a lot of these glasses that are extremely tulips like that which a lot of traditional glasses are um it also in addition to concentrating the flavor it also concentrates the ethanol and so we're going to get way more of an alcohol burn because of the sensitivity here and so this glass was designed by this woman to essentially help open it up. It concentrates it in a little bit for the flavor and then it opens it up in theory to get that alcohol a little bit out of the way so that you can really get to the nitty gritty of the actual flavors of your spirit. And so they're doing incredibly well. They've already been adopted as the official tasting glasses in a couple places, um, things like that. And so uh, for women out there, it's called Neats. And they're really, really fascinating. And it's also a really cool side-by-side -side with different glasses, have fun with it. Everyone's a little bit different. Everyone's palate and noses are a little bit different. So it can be fun to experiment. Um, and even I think on this call, we have some glass makers. I mean, it's all shapes of glasses are absolutely fascinating to try. And uh, we've done some glass blowing events ourselves. It's amazing to make, to make glassware, to try whiskey in. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a fascinating, yeah. huge world. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think it all comes down to, at the end of the day, what you have at hand, you know, we are certain times we have to be professional in what we're doing on the nosing and tasting side. But really, like we do back home in Scotland, just drink whiskey with good friends and enjoy it, you know, so it would, uh, I think it would be embarrassing to see the lineup of vessels I've used to drink whiskey out of over the last decade. <laughs> okay. Now, as we move back onto the Balvenie Five Rare Crafts, we move on to a gentleman that 
I think for many ambassadors is probably the favorite of any one of the distillery workers. And he is, he's, He's one of my favorites personally because he's a keen salmon fisherman and he fly fishes on uh, the River Spey, which is about four miles from the distillery. So I can do a day of work fishing with Dennis McBain, our coppersmith, and I just learn stuff from him. And when I say learn stuff, the amount of time I've spent with Dennis over the years and and really the opportunity I've just had just to be in around him uh, to learn what he's done over the years has been exceptional because someone that's worked in an industry for 63 years and to my knowledge is the longest serving member of staff at William Grant and Sons is fantastic for a storyteller like Naomi and myself. And what's great about Dennis McBain or Coppersmith, if you think back 63 years ago in the whiskey industry, there was a lot of point that health and safety just was not a thought that you know the guys who smoke next to the stills they smoke everywhere in the distillery probably it's not done now for hygiene reasons but you can't even take a picture in these places in the distillery and then everyone was boozing everyone was trying to sneak away whiskey pilfer whiskey and there's some beautiful stories of that but why we have a coppersmith on site is that really the thing that makes a difference between every different single malt scotch that's out there, and I think about 120 plus now that are being made in Scotland, is that size and shape of stills really gives you the foundations of how your flavor is going to develop in those casks. And each one has a different size and shape. And we use copper for three reasons. One, Copper is relatively easy to shape, a softer metal. I'm sure anyone that works out there with metal knows that. I'm not going to lie. If someone gave me a block of copper or and a block of titanium, I'm probably not going to get much done with either. But for people that do know what they're doing, it's a bit softer. Also, um, copper removes, uh, sorry, for the next one, I will uh, we'll move that one to last. Uh, copper, obviously, a great heat conductor. And in Scotland, we're definitely too tight to have gold stills uh, boiling away there. And then the third one is that copper removes congeners from the spirit. So before we, essentially what we're doing when we're making whiskey is we grind up that malted barley, soak it, then ferment it. And that fermentation starts alcohol, and after about 22 hours, flavor esters start to develop because it goes into an anaerobic state and there's a development of flavor. Depending on how long that fermentation is, you're going to have different levels of ester development. Now, once you turn that and put that into the stills and start heating it up and concentrating that alcohol, there's a lot of things in there that we don't want. So over time, as the liquid is hitting the sides of the stills, possibly rolling back down into the boil ball or maybe into the condensers for the next stage, it's reacting with the copper, removing nasty things that we don't want in our bodies. And then one of the main things, it's going to be sulfurs and sulfur notes that we're going to be taking out. And depending on that size and shape of stills that you have, you're going to either have a lighter, or heavier style of whiskey. Now, over time, as the stills are working and that copper is reacting, this copper is getting thinner. And what's amazing is with Dennis, with his 63 years of service, that he can tap different parts of the stills to essentially work out how thin or thick they are. And just by tapping, he can tell if it's too thin. And we remove uh, parts of the still, cut out parts of the still that are getting too thin, just in case the still collapses in on itself. That happens, the still runs out of the wall of the distillery and into a condenser, and we'd rip the wall and roof off. So having Dennis there on site, maintaining our stills, passing down that traditional knowledge to newer members of the team on how to... Uh, basically build stills and repair stills is really, really important for us. And, uh, you know, Dennis is 
it is is such a character and uh certainly I think Naomi and myself could probably do a whole session around just Dennis McBain and his stories. But um, yeah, certainly someone to look out for if you're ever up in uh, Duff Town. So there we go. I know we went to uh, the spot where it's made for Scythe's Fire Distillery, where we make our, our pot stills. And we went with Dennis and I swear to God, it was like entering with a celebrity. Everyone got so nervous. And I saw one boy drop a hammer. He got so nervous and distracted that Dennis was nearby. He's uh, just an absolute legend in the industry. And we're so lucky to have him for, yeah, I think longest running in the company, Neil said, I think is, is true. It's absolutely insane. People refuse to retire. That's kind of a funny thing. Uh, uh, a little bit later, I'm gonna chat about kind of the master apprentice relationship that we have at the distillery, but people stay so long, you can be an apprentice for decades <laughs> because no one will no one will leave, uh, which is probably a, a pretty good sign about how things go over there. Uh, one of our next, the next rare craft that's really a fun one for me, I already talked a little bit about the wood, uh, is our cooperage on site. And so we have a full-time cooperage. So a cooperage is where you make and repair barrels. Uh, and there are a bunch of huge, huge cooperages in Scotland, like Speyside Cooperage, uh, like Kelvin Cooperage in the US, these huge, amazing, uh, enormous places, but they service tons of distilleries. And so the benefit of having your own cooperage on site is it only has to concentrate on us. Uh, Glenn Fiddick tries to say it's their cooperage too, which is adorable. No, it's our cooperage. Uh, but we have this amazing place on site with 14 full-time coopers that are working on these barrels. Uh, that's 10 full-time and then four apprentices at any given moment. Uh, there's one little apprentice corner in this huge warehouse that's our cooperage. Uh, it's one of the most incredible sights you will ever see is this cooperage as, you know, hopefully when the world is a little bit better and we can open up for tours again. If you ever get over there, you get to take this bird's eye view look at the cooperage. Uh, on a trip I was supposed to take there recently, I actually had this whole uh, permit set up to be able to do a bird's eye view time lapse of the cooperage to be able to watch all these coopers work for an entire day because it's incredible. Um, and it's one of the most sought after apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeships in Scotland, which is also really lovely. Uh, a lot of the, the larger places do pay by barrel. So you get paid the more barrels you create, um, which is, you know, is one thing, but that can also result in some safety hazards and things like that. And so for us, it's not, it's just a set salary. And I've chatted with some of the Coopers about how much they love uh, that kind of compassion and security that comes along with the Cooperage at the Balvenie. Uh, when you go for part of your induction, my first time there, uh, I had to build a barrel <laughs> myself from some barrel staves they had, uh, which I think is half of their just, they get to, you know, enjoy watching me embarrass myself. Uh, but it also is so loud in the cooperage. So you have to wear uh, earplugs all the time. It's insanely loud. And the issue is I'm an American. I'm the, uh, I think, only American our, on our ambassador team right now. Um, and trying to understand extremely thick rural Scottish accents with the pounding of all of these coopering tools and all this woodworking happening. While myself, I'm holding these heavy, crazy tools trying to build this barrel. I um, thought that was the day I was gonna die. Uh, I made it through. <laughs> Still didn't understand about 80% of what he was saying, but I hoped that I at least, you know, I didn't injure anyone, uh, but it was it pretty, just the most, impressive incredible experiences and for those two watching who might not you know have seen a lot of whiskey barrels on site some of these barrels are huge like the size like i could easily fit in almost any of these barrels i mean they're absolutely enormous and they're so heavy and these men push them around like they weigh you know as much as this bottle it's absolutely incredible the work they've done on these barrels and they understand the physics of it so well it's like watching an art form honestly and um you know that apprenticeship is so important and especially because wood is like i said earlier you know it's a natural element so every barrel is going to be a little bit different uh our head cooper for many many years the things that he could spot on a barrel just from a two second glance of weaknesses in the wood potential things that could go wrong cracks splits this absolute expertise was just uh one of the most impressive things i've ever seen and the whole team is they're truly artisans. And also it's very important because uh, for those of you who are getting kind of into whiskey, oak is really one of the most important and most influential parts of the entire whiskey making process. These barrels give it, some people claim 70% of the flavor of a whiskey. And so we could make 
a stunning new make whiskey, which is the phrase for right off the still, right after we distill it. Uh, but if you put it into a, a barrel that's not proper, it's gonna throw the entire thing off. And so to have a team that's dedicated only to serving and watching over our casks is truly, truly an honor. So awesome. Neil, do you wanna talk about uh, David or do you wanna answer no. the questions or what are you thinking? I don't think too much popped up on the question front. I was keeping an eye, but certainly for me, the cooperage is one of my favorite parts of the distillery, watching them work on the casks and never knowing what's going through there and the sights and smells. And, and really about 70% of everything that we pick up in the glass and we enjoy from the glass comes from the maturation process in these very different casks, which brings me on beautifully, I feel, to another whiskey. And I, I think really what keeps um, Naomi and myself in the job as I try and slide this in there, the Balvenie 12 double wood. And this is our entry level uh, whiskey essentially, but by no means this is an entry level scotch. And in days gone by, I, I worked in the hospitality industry and what made me fall in love with Scotch was the people enjoying it at the bar and the stories that they had about the most random of bottles. And the Balvenie 12 Double Wood was one of the first bottles of whiskey that I was ever given as a present. And I was given it by my sister, uh, of all people, uh, who's a year younger than me. So she, she wasn't old enough to legally get me a bottle of whiskey, but this is what she bought me. And I think this whiskey is exceptionally complex. I think when we find and look at the world of, you know, the entry level proposition from any distillery, the they've changed a great deal. Um, and uh, sadly, I had some technical difficulties. So my laptop isn't on, I'm doing this off of my phone. Um, so I can't see everyone's faces. But um, this, this, this whiskey has been around for 26 years. And if we look at all of our friends and competitors in Speyside, McAllen always served a 10 year old. Uh, Moranji was always a 10. Glenn Livett always had an age statement of 12 on it. Even our older brother, Glenn Finnick, it was a pure malt when this whiskey first came out as its description. So this whiskey stayed the test of time. And for many, it's what they think of of Balvenie. And also the fifth and final one of our five rare crafts, which is our malt master, a gentleman called David Stewart. And his signature is on every bottle of Balvenie, so it's really easy to remember. And he pioneered this uh, process called double cask maturation in its full term, or what's more commonly known as cask finishing. And he pioneered that in eight, uh, 18, he's not that quite old, uh, 1983. And Balvenie was the first one to ever use this process. So this whiskey's aged in ex-bourbon barrels for 12 years, and then it's finished off in Spanish oak, Oloroso seasoned sherry butts for about six to nine months of finishing. And what you get is an exceptionally complex, fun whiskey. And um, on the nose, it's honey and vanilla, Balvenie's house style with some light spice notes. And for me, some like almost some candied orange in there. But then whiskey's obviously for drinking. So it's larger. And, you know, the Balvani 12 in the mouth as an entry level is amazing. It's really complex. And it starts off with that little pop of alcohol. Now, let's be fair. Anyone that calls whiskey smooth, brand ambassadors don't like that. That's a little secret for you guys going into the future. I don't think the scotch is to be smooth because, you know, they were designed to be nice and warming for us up in the Highlands on those cold Scottish nights. But that quickly dissipates above any on the spectrum of how robust the alcohol is. It's quite delicate and it moves into a honey vanilla sweetness that plays around. But in the middle of the palate, the tannings from the Spanish oak, which David Stewart picks particularly for the spice notes of 
for finishing this product just once for about nine months gives us a dryness in the mouth. We get more robust oak spice. And I, that dryness really reminds me of like a dry white wine that you start to salivate and the oak takes a hold. And then as that settles down, it just moves into something sweet and oaky. I just think it's a great whiskey all in all. And really for many whiskey lovers, that's where David is so famous for. But David's story, like many of the other craftsmen, starts a long time ago. It starts off in 1963. As David left school, he, his mother and father essentially told him, David, you have to get a job. You're 17. You've got no more school. So David, a really mannerable young man, I would imagine, applied for three jobs. Banking, an insurance job, very boring. But in the Glasgow Herald of 1962, of August of that year, there was an advert in the, in the paper for a stocks clerk for William Grant and Sons, essentially a bookkeeper. David applied for all three jobs and was offered all three jobs. Funnily enough, the 17-year-old loon took the whiskey job. And he was working under the then master blender for the company, only the third to have worked for the company, a gentleman called Hamish Robertson. Hamish liked him and he started training David after a couple of years on how to make the blends. In those days when David started, the world was drinking blended whiskey. Single malt was not a thing. And really, it was only us hardy Highlanders that were drinking that fire water from the Highlands. And over time, Hamish has taught uh, David, taught him more, to a level where David knows how to make the blends. And a blend of whiskey is always different whiskeys. As Naomi touched on, oak is a beautiful individual thing that can really change how the spirit is in each cast. And he learned that. Hamish then left the business and we could, we had no one else that knew the blends. David Stewart, still not 30 at this stage, was really too young to have one of the most important jobs at the distillery. So the family were looking for someone more experienced. On six months, then uh, David didn't make any mistakes and the family couldn't find anyone <laughs> ever since he's been head of the distillery, which is amazing. I wish it was more glamorous. And over the years, spent a lot of time with him, but his, his knowledge and how he shaped what this whiskey industry is, not only the single malt scotch whiskey, but whenever you look at a back bar or in a liquor store of whiskey all around the world, whether it's Taiwanese, Aussie, Japanese, American, David's helped shape what we drink on his trials that he's done and performed and bottled uh, working for the Balvenie over these years. However, you know, David's worked with us for, since 1962 and there has to be a level of progression. And I think uh, no one is better to talk about this young lady than Naomi because she, she had an exciting week with her not long ago in New York. Well, maybe about a year ago now. Sorry, I shouldn't be rubbing normalities into you. Yeah, so, um, you know, I mentioned I was going to chat about kind of the master-apprentice relationship a bit more because I feel like that's extremely pertinent to craftspeople as well, uh, who you've learned from. And, you know, very few people in the crafts world and at the Balvenie as well learn how to do their job from a PowerPoint, right? It's very hands-on. It's, you know, the people that teach you are so important uh, in the whiskey world for us, as well as, you know, the hospitality industry as a goal, you know, as a whole, I have my own appre apprentice master relationships in that world. Uh, and so the woman who will be eventually taking over for David Stewart, she's working with him now, has been for, I think, close to eight years now, um, is Kelsey McKechnie. She is a force to be reckoned with. And for uh, a lot of times whiskey, uh, extreme whiskey lovers get almost up in arms when you talk about anyone possibly taking over for David because he is an absolute legend. I mean, he has his MBE member of the British Empire from the Queen. Uh, I, I've done events with him where before I had met him, people had joked that I had to be almost a bodyguard with him at whiskey events because people are so crazy. And I always thought they were kind of joking. And then I uh, have done some whiskey events where you have to physically be a bodyguard because people just freak out over David Stewart. Um, if we had more time and a, another day, a couple more drams in, I'll tell you guys a story about how I had to drag the ambassador to Guatemala off of him 
at a whiskey event because he wouldn't leave us alone. I mean, it's just, he's, he's a legend. And so with anyone taking over, people are going to be nervous, of course. Um, so I always just want to assure them that I have now spent quite a lot of time with Kelsey, both in Scotland. And then as Neil mentioned, quite a legendary week in New York when we launched our, our new stories range last, last summer. She is just as humble as David, which is absolutely astounding. She is whip smart. She started out in the lab at Gervin, our grain distillery, which helps with our Hendrix gin as well, doing analysis. Um, she has a, a master's degree in two different things. I mean, she's just absolutely a legend and will be very soon. So I always want to assure people that's gonna, it's gonna be okay. Uh, but the cool thing is that even with the thought of her potentially taking over, I mean, they are eight years in of working together side by side in that tasting room. and. It, Everything has been taught hands-on, will continue to be taught. Um, you know, she's not taking over tomorrow. Like it's gonna be this really ongoing, uh, incredible relationship that the two of them have and the, the palettes of theirs that are working together. I mean, I cannot wait, Neil, for a little bit when we get to see just, you know, all these whiskeys that are just getting put into barrels now that they worked on together. I feel like we'll have to do like kind of a legendary lineup of the specific whiskeys that was during their like overlap reign because it's, such such power in one room and such incredible palettes but well i i think that brings it beautifully on to uh, one of the questions that just came up which was uh, naming a few different types of casks mm -hmm. some of which we use poor sherry but talking about beer casks and funnier different casks and the question was what do you, do you think things are going too far and I think for my answer to that is that in Scotland, we have quite a stringent laws regarding our whiskey production. We've had to change that in recent years mm -hmm. because of the modern single malt production that's coming out of America, Tasmania, especially really pushing the boundaries of what can be done uh, with single malt, not really under Scottish law. So for me, really, what it comes down to is, does your distillery have a house style? And can you maintain that house style using different casks? And as long as you don't stray too far away from where that cask or, or that house style is or should be, I, I think go for it. Because as whiskey drinkers, we always are looking for something new and exciting and certainly we're fortunate that bad stuff that we make, which doesn't sometimes, amazingly, sometimes come out, we don't sell it. We don't bottle it. It's not going to be our thing. But I've certainly had some things that shouldn't have been bottled in the past in my eyes. So, yeah, it's, it's down to how much you want to keep that style there. Yeah. And I think, too, one of the great things about Belveni and the importance of a really good malt master like David and Kelsey is that you have to be so aware of that house style at all times. I mean, we have a huge core range, we have a single barrel range, we have a stories range, we have all these different things. Uh, and we want variety. We want different ones to appeal to different people for sure. But we also want to make sure they all still taste like Belveni. You know, nothing is so foreign and crazy and out there that doesn't taste like us anymore. And um, it is super important. I also saw two different questions as we were going about kind of uh, this one once open, how long is it considered good? And then another was asking about how to store the bottles. And I feel like those things go kind of hand in hand. Um, one thing it's whiskey is going to be good for a damn long time. You'd have to do quite a bit to, to mess it up. It's not a wine that a couple days later, it's not going to be great. Uh, but the thing is you want to try to keep it, you know, out of direct sunlight. Um, you also, if you're going to do it really long term for like really, you know, whiskey collectors or something where you have a bottle where you might want to keep it for a super long time, uh, keep it on its side because the corks, if it dries out like this, it could actually one crumble into the bottle a little bit. And as it dries, it can let in outside air and that can really mess with the whiskey. So again, that's an extreme thing. Like you could have this like this for a very long time. But I mean, if you're really planning on like collecting a whiskey or people, you know, buy a bottle for their future child, like crazy things like that. Make sure you keep it on the side so the cork stays moist. But do you have any thoughts on that, Neil? How long is whiskey good? <laughs> um, I, I'm, well, I'm, I suppose, exceptionally fortunate that I lived in Singapore that has the greatest whiskey bar in the world in it. So I got to drink a lot of really old whiskey, some of the predating 1900s. And one thing with whiskey is, yeah, um, it does change in the bottle. A lot of people don't think it does. Oxygen definitely affects it. 
And depending on which whiskey it is, depending how old it is, that can be in so, so many different ways. And I would, the only thing I would really say over and above what you said there was when it's at this kind of level, which is three quarters full, it's not a problem. It can sit in your shelf for years. And in fact, some kind of flat whiskeys that I've opened up in the past go back to it five, six months later. It can be a lot more vibrant. But once it's down to like a smaller um, volume, it might be worth decanting it in something smaller just to stop that oxidization. But some whiskeys, a little bit of oxidization can be quite nice. I quite enjoy it. So, yeah. Um, this is a could you could probably answer this a little bit better, Neil, with your geography. But the train from uh, from Speyside to Edinburgh. Someone asked they'll be there for the Fringe Festival. Uh, Speyside to Edinburgh. I mean, you'd have to go from Aberdeen to Edinburgh by train, I assume. Uh, uh, yeah. Aber so if I was doing the Fringe, I would probably be driving up from Edinburgh to Dufftown. Uh, the problem is there's not a great deal of good transport links from Aberdeen to Dufftown or Speyside. And the kind of the travel around Scotland, it's great just to do it yourself, take it slowly, take in the views. After you get out of like Edinburgh area, you know, I'm from up north, so I don't like those central belt guys very much. But once you start getting into the highlands, um, it's so beautiful and you can just cruise up and I would personally say that driving is a better option if you can and uh, don't, don't be don't be scared of those single track roads. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, no, he doesn't know what he's saying and you should definitely be afraid. Scottish drivers are terrifying. <laughs> All the cars are manual for one. There are no automatic cars and uh, uh, they, those little I'm here in Iowa, roads. Mate. It's safe. <laughs> oh, insanity. Left side of the road on those tiny winding roads. Yeah, terrifying. But it is a better way to see. It's very beautiful. And where we are, too, is so rural at the distillery. Like, there's not some major train line you can grab from the distillery to, to Edinburgh, unfortunately. it's uh, We are really in the middle of nowhere. But uh, the closest kind of more major, quote unquote, transport hub by the distillery, if you want to visit, is Aberdeen. Um, so that's about an hour's drive. From, from the distillery. But one thing that's cool if you make the trek is we're in a, a place called the, you know, Whiskey Row or the Whiskey Trail. Uh, and so we're within a, you know, 20 minute drive of McAllen, Aberlour, Glen Parkless, obviously Glen Fiddick. It's, you can get kind of a lot of bang for your buck in one little area of Scotland. So. And uh, one, one thing, if you do manage and everything going well next year and you can get up to the distillery, it'd be my absolute pleasure to host you. So oh, yeah. if you can reach out, um, I'm sure we can get details of me through to you somehow, but if uh, if you're up in Speyside, please let me, well, you know the dates, I will personally organize uh, someone to, um, to look after you guys for the day and I'll buy you lunch as well. So there we go, you can hold that. Hold me to that. <laughs> and please now let's open up the group to any uh, questions. Yeah. Yeah, I'll put my email address. In this the is that Brady, Brady Bunch uh, moment where everybody's welcome. If you if you do have access to your microphones or if you wanted to ask specific questions to both Neil and Naomi, we've got about five minutes left this afternoon. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Um, if you go, uh, we stayed in Krigalaki and uh, got a, a woman who drove a taxi to take us to the distillery, and it was nuts. <laughs> we had such we had such a great time. It was a uh, I think it was the two the two or four hours. I, I, I think it's four hours. Is that right? And she's oh Neil, oh, you're, you're, you're... <laughs> I can see his hands going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, just the one tour at Balvenie. We're exceptionally yeah. proud of it as well. Uh, yeah, and an exceptionally long one. So if you want to see a proper working distillery, it's, it's it, the one. It was fabulous. But the funny part of it was the taxi. I think it was a four-hour tour. I can't remember. But the woman that dropped, dropped us off said, I'll be back in six hours. And I was like, well, it's a four-hour tour. I'll be back in six hours. <laughs> we weren't ready when she showed up. That sounds great. 
and and don't be looking for the Hilton and Craig Alecky. No. We had the, we, had, we had a wonderful evening across the street from the hotel at the little place that has the Japanese whiskey. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, the Highlander. Islander. I was just going to say the Highlander, but I thought that's not, that, that can't be the name of it, but it was wonderful time. If you go stay in Craig Alecky. We've had some fun nights at the Highlander. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. yeah lots. That's, we had, lots. Uh, we had haggis and blood, blood pudding there. It was wonderful. I would hope. Nothing, nothing sets you up better uh, for the day coming than a uh, slice of the haggis. Neil and Naomi. Great. In closing, I was just curious if you could talk maybe a little bit more, um, just kind of close um, talking about your interactions with crafts, craftspeople, the very craftspeople that you came across in your bar workshops. I'm very curious about where you're seeing innovation in terms of and, and intersections between, you know, the, 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 the makers themselves and the servers themselves and the distillers themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been astounding. One thing I've loved is the kind of variety that comes along with it. Um, so many different types of craftspeople and some of them I've revisited uh, in cities because essentially we do the number of bar crafts by the, how large the city is. So in New York, I'll do a couple of year. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see with different groups of bartenders that come along with us. Uh, for those watching, we bring bartenders to actually make bar tools with craftspeople. So depending on the craftsperson, that could be a bar spoon that used to stir a cocktail. Uh, we've made strainers to strain out cocktails. We've made glassware, uh, cutting boards, all so many incredible things. Um, but it's really interesting to see the craftspeople interact with different groups and how they can really adjust to those different groups. And um, I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane what, what goes into some of these things that as a bartender, I think you take for granted when I was just using all of those tools all of the time until suddenly, <laughs> It was make your own. I was like, oh, okay, this is uh, <laughs> quite a bit more impressive than I fully realized. So it was a, an enormous learning experience for sure. And I, I think I think one thing that I've always found with any of the bar craft sessions or things that we did before was when you have hospitality individuals, people, especially with the Balveni, that really were targeting the highest highest quality bartenders, servers, chefs, really that this country has because we're in so many great, great venues around the country, that these bartenders, these hospitality workers are so crafty. The art of hospitality itself is so amazing. And when you, when you look at, and when you get them in the room to kind of give them a blank canvas for any one of the, the craft events, it's very similar to what the gentleman just said about the Balvenie Distillery. It might it might only be two hour session, but it goes on and on because they want to be creative. They have an idea which is way way above their apprentice level stage, and then the the craftsmen we partnered with have helped beautifully to try and bring that to life as much as possible for them. So yeah, it's been some great sessions over here at Barcraft. Well, I know Neil and Naomi in closing, had we been in the Bay Area, I am sure we have, would have conjured quite an event that continued on and on, both in making the products and mixing and, and, and tasting the products. So one, just want to thank you for doing um, your work this way and connecting us all virtually, you know, as again, as a nonprofit that's really dedicated to connecting diverse craft communities, what you're all up to is absolutely spot on. And we just love these intersections and connections that you're making. So I want to thank you for all your time. Thank everybody for joining us today. Look at all the little claps. And this is where you, you, you well, I wouldn't say you'd pop your cork, but um, maybe you could just uh, maybe share, share us a, a toast here and lead us in a toast, if that's okay to close. So thank you so much for having us, genuinely. Such a treat. And uh, I'll leave the toast to the one with the Scottish accent. It's more satisfying that way. I know. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And certainly uh, I'm in the West, Naomi's in the East. And if you do want to look into some partnerships or something has inspired you from what you've said, please reach out to us because we're always looking for fun and creative ways to basically engage in the craft community. And when we're drinking scotch up in uh, the Highlands, the term that we use 
really as cheers, basically, Slanjavar. And I would definitely advise anyone out there trying to get your tongue all Scottish, uh, throw some whiskey around your mouth, first of all, and just get into it. And make sure when you say it, you say it with a loud group of friends, because nobody can hear you saying it wrong. So Slanjavar. Thank you all so much for having us. Lanjo, cheers. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.